I'm starting. Oh, bugger. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, no, I sorry. Totally I forgot. I'm it's sorry. me. You're waiting on me. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> this is the DMs Book Club. I am your host. I just remembered I'm your host. I knew that. It's always me every other episode. It's I'm... like clockwork. My name is Ryan. <laughs> I'm capable. I like talking about Dungeons and Dragons. I have with me somebody who's far more capable and remembers things and actually makes notes and is wonderful. It's Fiona. Hello, Fiona. <laughs> She's laughing. I just, because I, I was reading my notes and I wasn't going to say anything, you know, because I was just like getting it through and then you panicked and then I panicked. So I, <laughs> forgot, I thought you were waiting on me to talk I, because that is my job. It's it's exactly what I should be doing right now. It's fine. And we, we are a, a professional team here. And exactly. It's fine. Editing will do wonders for us, even though we've just talked about it. So it has to go in. So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now you have to put it in. It's your time to pick this week. Yes. What have you picked for us? So there's a big problem in D and D, Ryan. Okay. Um, <laughs> it started well. <laughs> it has started well, and I think one of the biggest gripes I have when I talk to people about why they don't run a D and D campaign or why they don't run a one shot they like playing in it but they don't like running it and one of the big things is that they lack confidence because all the players already know what the monsters are and they're not scared by it they know the ac they know what the attacks do they know everything about it and that's just through people reading about this stuff or playing it for many many years so people get intimidated for it i think that's one big part of it hmm. so there's that element of it as well that people already know the monsters but nobody wants to run it because they don't want to be like oh well they're just going to guess it all so there's two things you can do. One is to do an indifferent system entirely, which is what I do all the time. I go and I play one shots using like Grant Howitt's like one page one shots, Call of Cthulhu or, you know, all these sort of things. I like doing that because, and I recommend people do that in the sense of you can learn so much more from other systems and apply it to D&D, both as a player and a GM. Or you can put in a little bit of extra work and challenge yourself and then by default your players to come up with something new and actually create customized creatures for your own campaigns and your own one shots. So there's that. And here's the thing, Ryan, so many YouTube videos on how to create monsters are long and boring and don't tell you. And I must have spent like two hours yesterday trying to just look and just see if there was an example about how to do it as it's put done in the Dungeon Master's Guide. My God, Ryan, there are so many men talking about their concepts for ideas. And yeah. I, <laughs> you don't want that. I don't want that. I don't like that at all. Um, <laughs> so that's what we're talking about today is how do you use the method in the Dungeon Master's Guide, the sort of the how to create a customized creature, not necessarily from scratch, but a way to sort of like use the different methods and tools it gives you to sort of come up with a creature and then more importantly i think is to then play test it which again i think some people really struggle to do as well yeah and we're specifically looking at pages 273 onwards which kind of gives you an idea of a dungeon master's guide and i am definitely going to skim over that comment that you like to play games other than dungeons and dragons for somebody hosting <laughs> a dm's book club podcast i think you should think carefully about what you've just said of a system of a system i know but you know when you plug another podcast at the end of this podcast it kind of oh, God. <laughs> no, it becomes so it comes so circular say i want to create my own monster but mm. i'm lazy and i don't necessarily have the creative or an intellectual capability to do such a thing with tables what's the easiest way that i could go about doing this well, Ryan, first of all, you are not stupid. Of course you can do these things. But if you are, say, lack of time or you're just you're just really struggling, the That's simplest way of putting it. Of course. <laughs> the simplest way of doing it, this is the one that most of these YouTube videos talk about, is just modifying an existing monster. And I kind of want to just briefly talk about this because I feel like this is very good for beginner GMs who just want to add something. So mm. to modify one, things you can do easily is just change the name of the monster, change what it looks like, but keep the stats of what you want. So mm. if you, for example, wanted to do like a, a fire elemental, but you wanted to call it, I don't know, like a, a lava monster, that's it. That's a different creature. And it's incredible to do, you know, you have this creature and they're like, oh, well, it clearly is a, a fire elemental. And then you just refer to it. Okay, it's the lava monster's turn next. People then panic because that's not what they just said. And yeah, it might have very similar techniques and attacks and stuff. But 
you've already changed the monster. So I think you know, changing mm. the flavor stuff, so its look, the languages. If you want to do something like that, it can it can understand different kinds of languages yeah. and its name. The other two. Uh, sort of maybe one up from that so for example if you wanted to change what weapons it's got so you know you've got tons of bloody goblins and they all have the same <laughs> thing right why not why not give some of these uh, more beefier goblins and uh, maybe a goblin leader like a two-handed axe or a sword and like make them proficient in it and again that's just a little bit of tweaking then you just got to make sure that you account for it in the damage maybe if that's changes from like a one-handed weapon with a shield to a two-handed weapon then they're going to lose some ac so it's little things like that and then yeah. the sort of the final one on that so modifying an existing one is like adding a special trait so whether it's something that you cook up or if it's something from there's like the monster features which is on page 280 to 281 yeah. there's a whole ton of like sample sort of flavorings and special abilities that you could just add to a creature that's already there stuff like fly stuff like immutable form and stuff and then most of them just doesn't necessarily change that creature that much it's again it's just for flavor but if it does you just need to make a note of it somewhere uh, mm. so it makes it more balanced so that's like the main sort of way of uh, creating a different kind of monster is literally just take another one and change its name. And, and actually, it's, it's amazing how much of D&D is based purely on the descriptive powers of the dungeon master. Mm -hmm. You can take a stat block and literally change nothing apart from the way you describe something. And mechanically, there's no difference. But in somebody's head, it's really, really changed. And I, I was playing around with this. I, I, I took like um, something we've come across in our campaign. So a fire giant, for instance, which uh -huh. would, would throw... Uh, what's it called? Uh, it could throw a stone, which does about 25 uh, bludgeoning damage. So you can think, well, hang on, if I keep all the stats the same, mm -hmm. but I turn it into a huge eagle, which waddles along on two <laughs> oversized like eggs, but it, its wings are, are, are don't really work. It flaps them like a chicken. Mm. They have a tongue with a boulder on it that goes boom. <laughs> out of its mouth exactly the same stats it does, you don't need to change anything it's still a ranged attack it's boom, throws out and, and yeah it's suddenly a horrible chicken ostrich machine with a deadly tongue it's, it's all you've done is change the way you describe it and that's frightening Brian <laughs> I've got to be honest oh, please don't throw that at us I you know, can only just deal with the fire giants <laughs> <laughs> but the adding a special trait thing is, is a really 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 like I was, I was playing around with this before like that, mm -hmm. that grid on, on page two 280, mm -hmm. it's amazing what you can do to just make something different and there's so many of these if you have a look at the table the third column there's something called effect on challenge rating mm -hmm. if you find something in there that doesn't have a challenge rating chain you can apply anything from there and it's not really going to change the mechanics of how the game works it's just it's just really interesting like i, mm -hmm. I don't know i just like you could put terrain camouflage on a black bear mm. and suddenly it's like now it looks like a wall <laughs> <laughs> and it's gone <laughs> <laughs> it's a wall there oh. so let's say you want to take this another step up and you want to say hang on nothing nothing in the monster manual works for me what do i do where would you go from there so again, it goes into two bigger sets of sort of methods. There's one which is only four steps, which is sort of the quick monster stats method. And then there's the creating a monster stat block from scratch, which is 20 steps, which I do appreciate. That seems like quite a big leap, but essentially it's just more fleshing out a monster stat uh, block. So that, mm. and that's actually quite interesting. And again, like with all these things, you get your head around, but essentially it is this. On page uh, 274, there is the most important table, I think, of all time, and I may have to like frame it somewhere or just take a picture of it, just have it on me at all times because it is incredibly useful. So say I need to make a monster in five minutes. Like I, I for whatever reason, I forgot something and uh, it's happening. Okay, I know my party is like a four level four characters. So like the top end of the low tier, essentially. So low tier here being like one to four levels. So I'm like, okay, I want to have a creature that is at least a... Um, a challenge rating four. So I go to this table and I go to the row that says four and I look across and in this table, you've got stuff like proficiency bonus, armor class, hit points, uh, hit point range, sorry, attack bonus, damage per round and a safety C. So you have, you get those, they're sort of the very basic uh, sort of like examples you can have. You write those down and then the step 
which is basically what happens in the longer method is all spread out into different steps. It's essentially change what you want, just the stats and record these new ones next to it. So, you know, if you want to add a few more hit points to it, maybe add another 10, go for it. If you want to add a bit more AC, do that. Save DC maybe comes down a bit. As long as you've got a concept in mind what this creature does, that helps a lot with how to work out these things as well. So take, for example, if you have, let's say, a, a goblin soldier. And you get, you know, say we want it to be a challenge rating four. So they're going to have, according to this uh, table, they're going to have a plus two to proficiency. They're going to have an armor class of 13. They're going to have hit point range between 86 to 100, uh, which we'll come back to. Attack bonus of plus three. The damage output per round is between 15 to 20. And then a save DC of 13. So you've got all nice base ones there. Mm. So what, what makes this goblinoid soldier really impressive or really sort of like different to another one well i'm gonna say maybe it doesn't have as much health maybe it's, it's going to be a bit lower so maybe about 70 hit points so that would come down and uh, record that next to that bracket but i want the ac to be up. i want it to be a proper plated goblinoid i'm thinking like in labyrinth when they go into the goblin city all these goblins are covered in plate armor and they look ridiculous but it's very hard to kill them mm. so i would change that and once i've adjusted all that i then try and work out what the final challenge rating is and i will say ryan this is possibly one of the worst badly worded passages in the whole book <laughs> yes it's 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 one of those things where once you get your head around the calculation it kind of makes sense but getting to that place you've got to give it a try a few times and go by it step by step it's it's really really complicated as a bit of a, a behind the scenes the table you were talking about is about page 274 mm -hmm. mon statistics by challenge rating mm -hmm. as a dm i have that printed on every single session sheet that i bring in because no it's way. a brilliant like default i need to generate something it gives me an idea of roughly how the hard things should hit at different challenge ratings and whatever what i would say is that sheet from experience it gives quite a lot of hit points based on any monster in the monster manual of an equivalent rating mm -hmm. but it's normally because if you throw anything from that block against people that are capable, mm -hmm. they will dispense with it very quickly. Normally, the monster manual is very good at giving lots of abilities and lots of things that make things difficult to kill. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this tends to give quite low AC, quite high hit points, quite high damage, but, you know, mm. very basic enemies. Exactly. No, and that, that's absolutely true as well. Because when I, again, going through this, I was like, God, I have a lot of hit points. I, yeah, but you're right, because a lot of times players do have extra items. They are using spells and they, you know, they can use certain spell effects to paralyze or, or add conditions onto monsters as well. So you have all this sort of to come in mind as well. But again, that's sort of for the later one. But essentially, to work out what the final challenge rating is and to know how hard your monster is and whether it comes into a, an easy encounter, a medium encounter, a hard encounter, or a deadly encounter, which is all based on sort of the uh, challenge rating, you have to work out what the defensive challenge rating is and what the offensive challenge rating is. So defensive, you read down the hit point column till you find where they are. So using that example of the goblinoid soldier I just sort of came up with, I've said mm -hmm. it's got 70 hit points. So we're going down. That actually only puts it down to challenge rating, and I look across, sorry, and that is challenge rating a half, essentially. So mm -hmm. I make a note of that just so I've got it there. And then it looks at the armor class for it. So the armor class for a challenge rating half is just 13. And then here comes the difficult bit. <laughs> So I'll read it out, just because otherwise I'm going to get it wrong. If your monster's AC is at least two points higher or lower than that number, so that critical rating number, then you need to adjust the critical rating challenge suggested by the hit points, so that thing, up or down by one for every two points of difference. So if I said it was an AC of 20, for example, and that's 13, so that's te technically... Oh, 18. Let's give your, 18. your full plate example you. of goblins and full plate. Yeah, so that is uh, that's five points difference. So you need to go up at least three bands. So that puts it in challenge rating three. So you've got that there. So you make a note of that. So that's its defensive challenge rating is three. And then you work out offensive challenge rating. So, and that is exactly the same sort of thing, except you read down the damage per round column. 
and then look at that critical rating. And then you look across at the attack bonus. And again, if that is higher or lower, depending on what you tweet, then you do the same thing. You, you go up or down the challenge rating by one for every two points of difference. Mm. And once you have those two possibly very different numbers, you then just take an average of the two. So if you're like me and had to look up how to do an average, you add them together and then divide by two. And that would be the final sort of uh, challenge rating. But what I would say is that that doesn't necessarily reflect how an encounter will go. It's a good idea to know how difficult a challenge would be for four people, but they could easily steamroll it or they could mm. easily find it hard purely because of the dice rolls. It's just more making sure that what you throw at them won't necessarily be a complete pushover or a complete TPK. There's no right answer, is that? Yeah, no. Different people will have different weaknesses and different advantages. Like I know with our group, anything that is a melee combatant, which hits with melee attacks, is going to be a lot weaker against you than anything with flying or magical ability because you're just all a very melee-orientated party and you're very mm -hmm. tough and have lots of hit points in AC, but not as good at maneuverability or bits and pieces like that so you have to feel your way through it but it's a good i, I like the way it splits between defensive and offensive challenge ratings because mm. it is true you can have horrendously hard-hitting skeletons that then brittle and, and shatter into a thousand pieces on the first impact mm. but it is complicated isn't it the second way of doing it where you really take it apart and you break it down do you think it's best if we if we go through it and give examples that we've made to explain mm. it? Because I think it's it's getting your head around it is yeah. a bit tricky. It is tricky. And I think this is would be my one point from what I've seen in the book and what I've seen on these YouTube videos. I know I keep going on about them, but there's, I've, I watched so many to try and get this right. <laughs> um, there is not worked for example. Like, and to be fair, like as I was trying to describe it there, I just picked an example about different things. But there's not like a work for example going from step one all the way to step 20 in the creating a monster stat block from scratch. But in the player's handbook, obviously, there is a player creation guide about how to create your character using um, the dwarf, uh, Bruno, or something like that. And mm. I was a bit like, you know, that would have been really, really helpful to have in this book. And maybe I just haven't seen it or haven't read it, but like going through, you'd think it'd be here. And I guess it's just more like, oh, we don't want to just typecast um, a particular monster that we always use for creating this. But I just thought it would be quite nice, actually, to have a work for example. So I think, yeah, that's my takeaway advice for this. As someone who's never created a monster before today, um, don't panic <laughs> <laughs> and definitely reread it several times because it's going to yeah. be... It's going to be and hard. Give it a few, a few goes because it'll all make sense once you've done a couple of complete examples. You'll look at it and you'll say, ah, oh, that makes sense. I can see kind of where it was going for. Mm -hmm. So what have you prepared for us? What have you got to, to try and explain this giddy assortment of rules? So the first thing you'd always ask, and like I said, the first thing that all these YouTube videos ask is, like, what is your concept? What is it you want to change? And actually, my idea came from several things. I have recently finished playing The Last of Us. And what I noticed in The Last of Us and in case you haven't played it, it is a post-apocalyptic set in the modern world where there are zombies. Uh, yeah. Yes. But what I find in obviously in D&D, zombies are very easy to kill. They are like ten a penny and they're just, uh, they're, you know, they're easy kills. And obviously that's mostly because you've got armor, you've got swords and stuff. But in The Last of Us, it's quite frightening because you can have improvised weapons and stuff and they just come and they, they surround you and it's horrible. So there's that side of it. And I was like, I want to create something that is a pack animal or can work in packs that you see it and it just draws fear because you know if you if you draw attention to it or if it starts to follow you, it's just going to cause you a lot of pain. So that was sort of my in initial sort of thing. And then we last time we were talking about the different outer planes and stuff. And I had a quick read on the other sort of planes that we hadn't mentioned, so the elemental planes. And there is the ice plane, which is where the water plane and the air plane mix mm. together. And... I was like, there's obviously ice-based creatures in it, but there's not an ice elemental from what I can tell on D&D Beyond. So I was like, why not have something that is a uh, an ice elemental, but is sort of not as big as the other elementals, but it has this sort of nature of a zombie-like thing. So it's something that you, if you're out on the mountainside or if you're trying to uh, get to another village, you have to be aware that there are these packs of just awful things that are rumored about but they come after you and they will try and kill you essentially so that was sort of my idea and then of course i had a quick google for snow puns 
And I thought <laughs> frostbite, frostbiter would be an I excellent know. I one. I saw that and I did roll my eyes. But I have to say, the, the idea of an ice elemental combined with a last for us zombie this is a horrific idea and you're an a evil person so congratulations Aww. that's that's brilliant thank you so th- well that is my concept uh, ryan what is your concept that you've brought to this table well so i in the usual way that i like to just take things too far i um <laughs> i was thinking about whether or not this could be used to make uh, a really tough enemy and specifically a, a big bad for a campaign mm-hmm. so i had to go at making a huge undead commander whose job was a bit like a lich sort of bringing himself back to life but this is more of a sort of huge walking skeleton with magical powers who wants to take over an undead kingdom so i've called her the mistress of bones but it's it's my attempt it was my <laughs> original attempt at making a challenge rating 20 big bad nice. um, and you'll see to what extent i failed at doing that wow. and to what i didn't no, I, I, well, I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, I, I would say as well for my Frostbite one, again, thinking of challenge rating four, again, something that's lo- that you would encounter, encounter at lower levels on that sort of thing. And yeah, size, medium, and type elemental. Um, and that's the other thing I'll quickly mention before we get really into it, is that if you want to look at the different types of stuff and maybe a bit more in detail about like size, uh, types, and uh, alignments and stuff like that, the, the front couple of pages of the Monster Manual is actually very good at explaining all of that. Because obviously in the Monster Manual, you have all the stuff that's there but sometimes you're just like i'm not so sure what it is so that's also very helpful to have a quick look at as well so we're going to be creating these based on the more complicated section so they're creating a monster stat block mm-hmm. section should we go through it in steps so step one what's the name of your creature uh well, monster biter done <laughs> the frostbiter i thought oh frostbiter oh no i you fucked up your own pun oh Terrible. no yeah, step two, <laughs> what's its size so I went for a medium size because a lot of the elementals are larger because uh, obviously they take up space. Whereas I imagined this creature as a, a zombie s type thing, maybe just something like almost completely made of, of ice and, and glass. So something that's the same size as a normal humanoid, so six feet, essentially sure. so medium. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, step three, type. What type is it? So I went obviously for elemental, but obviously you've got all those other things as well. I did think about putting it as maybe a monstrosity as well, which is basically the generic. It's something else than it's hideous. It's, yeah. Exactly. Do, do not like. I said you do not want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you've also got undead, I guess, is the other way you could have gone. Um, Absolutely. On yeah. That one. Alignment. Mm. So what alignment did you go for? So this will be an interesting one and maybe something you would tweak, perhaps, because again, in the book, it says that if your monster has no concept of morals, it is unaligned. And I think for this one, the reason I sort of chose chaotic evil is quite a lot of the elements are uh, neutral. Mm. or neutral evil i think and this is the thing this these creatures have no sense of right and wrong per se they just want to eat and they just want to kill like as any zombies would so i put chaotic evil but maybe really just uh, just and but they're chaotic in it so i don't know I, I was tossing up between sort of like neutral evil and chaotic evil for that yeah ultimately it doesn't matter really you can mm. you can have whatever and you can justify and whatever yeah chaotic evil is more of a like they know what they're doing a little bit and they're like they love it they really mm. enjoy it for the sake of it so no i like that that's good mm-hmm. so step five i find this one a little bit daunting um mm. to sort of go in so what i normally do is i switch these two round i would go for step six Ooh. expected challenge rating what what challenge rating did you want to go for so you, you were aiming for four yes i was aiming for four sounds good so we go back to step five ability scores and modifiers how did you go about picking some ability scores for your creature so essentially it is exactly what we said right at the beginning it is looking at similar monsters and just choosing from them and that's kind of what i did i basically just cloned the water elementals uh, type so again for me i put strength plus four dex plus two con plus four and then intelligence minus three whiz plus zero and then charisma minus one but again these are the sort of things i just i thought i'd just take those and just see how this worked but i could always make them a little bit more intelligent perhaps if i wanted to get them in to be more chaotic evil maybe i'll just put them on the same level as a normal sort of uh, human so that yeah. would be like a, just a plus zero for both intelligence and wisdom exactly exactly remember that a a zero stat or a 10 stat depending on how you look at it is supposed to be an average human so that's kind of the level you're you're aiming at here so you've described somebody that's quite strong quite tough pretty pretty nimble as well but Mm -hmm. mentally not so good Mm -hmm. exactly 
Step seven, armor class. Uh, what did you decide to that? So in armor class, it talks about like, again, you could use the table to help you look at what it is, or you can choose to add, add whether they've got manufactured armor, whether they've got natural armor or have a spell bonus. So like, you know, um, oh, complete mage armor. I completely forgot what the yeah. name of that spell was. I know it. Um, <laughs> and I thought what was very helpful, certainly in this book, it talks about natural armor saying, it's just literally, if you think of armor as when you're a player character, it's obviously 10 plus your decks plus the armor. Um, and that's what I sort of did for my one. I sort of put 10 plus the decks and then I put natural armor and natural armor, it talks about being sort of either plus between plus one and plus three. And I thought ice is actually quite hard um, depending on what you, you're doing with it. And hmm. so I thought thinking about the, those zombies in certain the high fantasy stuff, I don't want them to fall down straight away. I want them hmm. to have a little bit more toughness to them. So I went for an AC of 14. 14. And weirdly enough, that is actually what the table said as well. So you're kind of bang on what it suggests. So that's that's, that's pretty good. Mm. So hit points, step mm. eight. How did you go about that one? So again, in uh, this, you could either refer to the table or you can choose. So the type of hit die you get uh, is depends on your size. So obviously with a medium, mm. you have a look at the table that's given and it is a D8. And it's quite interesting here. It says, it says creatures can have as many hit dice as they want. It doesn't necessarily have to align with the critical rating level the thing you've got to remember is that when you're working it out so if you for example in this one i thought i'll just do 4d8 because i want them to have some hit points but also i want to have it so there's quite a few of them so there's no point in having you know a decent size armor but i want to have more creatures in them so i was factoring that in as well later so 4d8 plus the constitution which is four so four times four is 16 so you can either have 4d8 plus 16 or as the average sort of hit point is what i worked it out to be 34 so you can either use one of those and the good thing about this is it says either use the table or do it by the hit dice as much as what you've done mm -hmm. and it says throughout it doesn't matter if you don't hit the table because it all works out afterwards so mm. if you were to look at the table it's actually suggesting you could have hit points between 160 and 130 mm. Mm -hmm. but here we are with 34 hit points so you'd think oh well that's not right at all mm. but it will work because it all comes in later and you've mm. all just got to sort of work it out later and there's reasons why in a little bit that this mm. might work so step nine damage vulnerabilities resistances and immunities so this is a little bit uh, funny and, mm. and this is more intricate the weaker the monster you have if, if you've got a weak monster this will come into play a little bit more so how did you go about looking at vulnerabilities resistances and immunities mm. so another thing it says during the sort of the methodology of this it talks about like think about it logically what would your creatures be damaged if you were fighting them how would you describe it and then as well looking at the elementals for examples as well all the elementals are resistant to bludgeoning piercing and slashing damage from non-magical attacks so i put that in there because i thought it's an elemental damage immunities i put for cold and poison because it turns out all elementals are immune to poison which again makes sense because they're sort of <laughs> elementals and they don't have internal organs but also as it's um, an ice creature it would be immune to the cold so i thought Hmm. So I put that there in there as well. And then in terms of vulnerabilities, interestingly, and again, I'm sure people will correct me on this, there didn't seem to be any vulnerabilities for elementals, but I'm now working off the assumption that it's like Pokemon. So you're going to have a something that's strong against you and something that's weak against you. And of course, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I thought most people, if you're out in the, um, in the icy tundra and you get attacked by these creatures, they'll have uh, fire weapons or they'll be able to shoot fire. And that actually would be quite cool because then, you know, it's a way to fight these creatures off and frighten them. Um, so I put damage vulnerabilities of fire in there as well. So this explains that if you've got resistances that may be a problem for a party at the average level, then it affects what they have started to call the effective hit points. And this, mm -hmm. is, this is getting mathematical, but you have a creature that is CR4, so you would expect people to be around level three to five mm -hmm. coming against this creature, which is first tier of play. That's the first sort of bracket of D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. So magic items are not going to be necessarily prevalent in everything. So exactly. putting bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks, that's a fairly decent resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be, you know, really interesting. So mm -hmm. what you've done, and I'm having a look at your calculations, is you've, you've taken hit points 34, Mm -hmm. You've times it by two, which is all based in the table they give you because mm -hmm. it's a challenge rating four. 
you're giving it a resistance that's important. So we've now given it effectively effective hit points, you could say, of 68. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting concept because it makes it, it feels different if you've got a creature which has 68 hit points. Like mm -hmm. that is, yeah, it feels a bit more tough, doesn't it? Yeah, and actually on the second read through of this, it says make a note of it. Obviously, don't change the hit points, but actually when you're not really a massive spoiler, but like when you're working out the defensive challenge rating, you use the effective hit points and not the actual hit points. And that, because it's just a throwaway line in this whole thing, that actually suddenly made a lot more sense because I was really struggling for me with all the different challenge ratings and stuff. And I was like, but... But it's def I definitely think I could kill people with this. I've given it quite a lot of resistance to things. Mm, yeah. So that's and It makes a difference because you've got a creature with 34 health as a challenge rating eighth, one eighth, whereas a challenge rating half for this creature with effective 68. It makes a big difference. It makes it's, a big um, difference. So yeah, so it's just, I think it's something that it is important to work out the effective hit points, but just keep it off to the side. And for me, I was like circling it and like, don't forget this number, <laughs> which I know sounds a bit sad, but it, it actually was very, very helpful. And it doesn't, <laughs> like I said, in all the sort of the views of stuff, there's only one video that sort of mentioned it saying, be aware of these effective numbers. Because again, it, when you look at the monster features list, those little bits of sort of description say, oh, add one to the effective attack bonus or the effective AC. And of course, I couldn't find anywhere that talked about effective stuff. But I realize now it's just having that number there and using that instead of the actual number you have. Yeah, it became very important in my one. And we'll, we'll, we'll go into that later. Exactly. But next step, step 10, mm -hmm. attack bonuses. So again, mm -hmm. it gives you an option. You can use the table or you can calculate your own. What did you end up going for? I just went for my own because it made sense. So currently the proficiency is just plus two with the strength is uh, plus four and together that is plus six. But then later on, as I sort of kind of mentioned that I picked a feature called pack tactics because again, I wanted the idea of like having a lot of these creatures coming in and attacking you. And it says in the thing, plus one to your effective attack bonus. So that's sort of in brackets for me to use at a certain point. So just being aware of that as well. Perfect. So we've got attack bonus of plus six, plus four strength, plus two proficiency. Makes sense. Mm. Step 11, yes. damage. So yes. again, use the table or base it on the damage of the weapon. What did you go through on this one? Oh, God, this was really hard, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I, it took me so long to try and work this out, and I still don't think it's right. So essentially looking at the table for uh, CR4, the range of damage per round it does is uh, between 27 and 32 total damage. So whether that's all in one hit or if that's in multiple attacks. And again, it sort of comes back to talking about how is this damage delivered? What do you want to happen? And in my head, again, thinking about these Last of Us zombies, I see them running up to people, scratching, uh, using horrific long, like jagged knife claws, essentially, uh, at people. So I wanted to give it a multi-attack, being able to claw at a creature twice, and then on a hit, because it talks about flavoring or adding some, yeah, attack riders, essentially, is a little box at the bottom. Mm. But I wanted to add something else. So yeah, of course, when one of these creatures hits you, it's going to try and grapple you. And then almost a bit like a vampire in a way it's going to bite you with its ice teeth um mm. so again these things are just quite small things so like you know a scratch attack or a claw attack and then a bite attack i would say not necessarily that much damage per per hit thing so like obviously so for the claw attack for example is a plus, plus six to hit reach of five feet one target uh, average hit uh, damage is an eight or it's a 1d8 plus four uh, slashing damage and then on a hit it, it grapples you the bite attack uh, same sort of thing plus six to hit reach a five one target uh, on a hit it deals seven so 1d6 plus four slashing damage if you're doing the dice rolls and then i wanted to do a con save similar to how when we have uh, like poison damage i wanted to be able to when something bites into you you feel that horrible coldness and you mm. feel that sort of thing so again very very small really but as a con save of dc 14 which actually could be quite difficult and on a fail take a 2d6 cold damage oh i'd need to change that number uh but yeah and oh, a half in it so again adding that sort of damage to it yeah, um but, it, but what you've done i mean it's brilliant you've got a creature with multiple attacks with a breath weapon effectively or like a, like an extra damage and mm -hmm. then you've also got a grapple thing which is it's all the bits of flavor that you'd want to give it a little bit of interest um mm -hmm. 
I mean, it talks about once you've found the damage, you've got to calculate its overall damage output. And I had to get my head around this a little bit because <sighs> you've got to ignore things like saving fairies and misses and just take the max damage on everything. Mm-hmm. So it, this is suggesting that for 27 to 32 damage, which is what you're getting, mm-hmm. you've got a creature that's going to hit twice of its claw. So that's mm-hmm. eight damage twice, 16. Mm-hmm. You've got a bite, which is seven damage, which is in a 23. 23. Yep. <laughs> and then you've got another six to seven on the hit with the bite from cold damage. So mm-hmm. you are now at 29 to 30, which is right slap bang in the middle of the table. Mm-hmm. Perfect job. That's exactly what you want. So that's really interesting, actually. And then, Ryan, I wanted to add more. <laughs> <laughs> so reading through this example, right at the end of the overall damage output, it talks about one-off things and abilities. And that's, again, this is where I was thinking, how could I upgrade this creature even more? If it's something like I wanted a lot of them or I wanted, um, you know, certain maybe higher levels of these creatures, you know, like sort of pack leaders perhaps, maybe having something like an ice aura. So it gives the example of Baylor's fire aura where if a creature starts its turn in its aura, you're going to take a 3d6 cold damage. If a creature that touches or hits it with an attack, it takes another 3d6 cold damage. So actually, it's not wise to be close to these things. And it instantly sort of jumps up to the average damage. So the average damage on those ones would be 10. So it adds another 20 to the output per round as well. Mm, that's a lot of extra damage, isn't it? So you've mm. got, yeah, horrible, icy, don't be near it, don't hit it with a melee attack. Exactly. And it, it, all, it all makes sense because, again, suddenly you've got something that's now doing 48 to 50 damage per turn which is more than what the guide says you should be doing but mm-hmm. doesn't matter because doesn't it matter. comes through next one step 12 save dc how did you go about that one so again you could choose it from the table or you can work out as you normally do for into save dc so it's a dc of eight plus your proficiency plus the relevant uh, monster ability and again that think goes back to your concept so for me when you're cold that's something to do with your health so i like the idea of being using the sort of the con modifier to do it so in the end it was uh, was it uh, eight plus two so that's my proficiency uh, plus con which is four so it's 14 total yeah, exactly. And that throws you, again, right bang on the table. So that makes sense. It seems to, seems to work. Seems to work. <laughs> exactly. Step 13, we, which is the one where you, where you add special traits, actions, reactions. And we've kind of, you, you've already dealt with this quite well, actually. So you've got your, your cold bite damage. You've got your claw that grapples people, your pack tactics, your mm-hmm. ice aura. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of bits and pieces that you've thrown in here. And every time we've, you've thrown something, you've been affecting its effective damage, mm-hmm. its effective health, its effective AC, whatever it may be. And mm-hmm. you've been keeping track of what its actual stat is mm-hmm. and what its effective stat is. I think that's the good thing to remember. You've got two stats on everything. Exactly. Yeah, you didn't think you wanted to give it innate spellcasting as well? Uh, I, I've got to be honest, Ryan, that paragraph really, really scared me. And so, <laughs> um, but again, it's something where if I wanted to upgrade this creature to something, maybe like, um, I don't know, like an ice lord or something like that, um, then I probably would maybe include some sort of icy um, spellcasting ability. But again, I thought for now, as it's such a as it's such a horrible creature anyway for uh, a low tier party, the last sure thing I wanted is, to do yeah. is, is cause even more havoc. <laughs> Exactly. So step 14, speed. How did you find, what what did you decide on speed? So I decided like in speed, so every creature has a walking speed. If not, they'll have some other kind of speed. So like whether they can fly, whether they can climb, burrow or swim. And again, thinking about these creatures, um, I've only put them at a speed of 40. So I like the idea that they're quick movers and they can outpace even the most, like the speediest of adventurers or keep pace with them. But maybe thinking about it now, maybe I would maybe add a climb speed as well, that they can just shift up various sort of ice cliffs at super Mm. speed. Maybe not super speed, but like 20 feet at least or something like that to sort of really put the heebie-jeebies in you. And the speed doesn't make any difference to the AC as no. long as it's not flying mm-hmm. uh, and has a ranged attack. That's that's kind of the thing that makes it difficult for low-level people because mm-hmm. that's just is. We're on to step 15, which is almost the last step now mm-hmm. before we kind of wind this down, saving mm-hmm. throw bonuses. So how did you go about this one? Oh, I completely forgot to do it, Ryan. So that's... That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It doesn't matter. This creature has no saving throw bonuses, and that's fine. If you, if you haven't given it anything, there's no change to the challenge mm. rating or to its effective AC. So that's absolutely fine. I've got a couple on mine, so I can show you an example. That's Perfect. not a problem. Perfect. So now we work out the final challenge rating. Yes. So you've got the expected, which is challenge rating four. Mm-hmm. And now we've got a final challenge rating. So... 
Should we have a look at this? If I read through the yep. what we're going to do. And oh, then God, I hope it works. Me, <laughs> no, this, is, this is good. So what we've got to do is we've got to work out the average, the defensive and the offensive challenge rating. So yes. defensive, we're going to read down the hit points column to work out what challenge rating it is with its modified HP. Yes. So the modified HP was it's 34 health mm-hmm. times by two. Yes. Because we had all the resistances. So it's 68. So yep. what does that make? It makes a half. And rating half. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. We now need to then look at the armor class suggested for a monster of a challenge rating. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're going to adjust it based on whether or not it's, it's sort of in and around. So you want a challenge rating for what AC have you got? So I went for 14 and the suggested one for a creature of half is only 13. There we go. So we're one out, which means we don't have to change it because it's no. not two out. So exactly. we're, again, within parameters. So our final defensive challenge rating is a half. Right. So there we go. It seems it, we're a few ranks under, but now we'll do offensive. Mm-hmm. So for the offensive, we need to have a look at the modified damage output per round. So what is that? So I've calculated it. It's within 45 to 50-ish. Yes, it's about 48, wasn't it? Because we had about yeah. 28, 29, and then we added the 20 in. That's right, yeah. Exactly. So that gives us a challenge rating of 7. 7, yes. Yeah, which is, which is very high, which is good. Um, so now we have a look at the attack bonus suggested for a challenge rating 7. So the table says that we should have plus six. What did you end up having for your adjusted attack rating? So the adjusted attack rating with the pack tactics was a plus seven. So we're not yeah. two out, we're within two. Mm-hmm. So no change. Yeah. So right. you've got <laughs> challenge rating half for defense. You've mm-hmm. got challenge rating seven for offense. Mm-hmm. We take the average, which is? Uh, it's 3.75. And exactly. round it up which to four and up <laughs> to challenge rating four so you have created Phew. the perfect challenge rating it. four monster Hooray. it's really good you've got something that can absolutely throw damage out but is pretty easy to kill if you know how to mm-hmm. the perfect swarmer it's yes. it's really good i like it. and you can see these things being horrifying in large groups just mm-hmm. jumping in and oh <laughs> and stuff and then there's a few other steps at the end that you can do that don't it doesn't change the challenge rating of the creature at all once you've found it you know what it is so things exactly. like skill bonuses did you think wanted to give any skill bonuses for it uh so i didn't in the end because i think everyone knows what these creatures are but again if it's that sort of thing maybe i'd add stealth perhaps because obviously if they're hunting in packs so maybe i'd yeah. add proficiency to that otherwise maybe not survival I'd, maybe survival you to track, to track. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. What about step 18, condition immunities? So again, I looked to the um, elementals and see what they were kind of doing. So again, I wanted to be something similar. So they're immune to exhaustion, being paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, and unconscious. So I just sort of took those on there. I didn't think there was anything else I would necessarily add because I, you know, if they want to grapple a frostbiter, they're more than welcome to, but it's just not, not <laughs> nice. <laughs> exactly uh what about senses so we, we've got to work out the passive perception which i believe for you would be it's about 10 isn't it for this yeah one? straight 10 yeah yeah straight 10 because we've got wisdom of, of, of zero yeah so that's good did you give it any senses at all yeah so i just again gave it a, a bog standard dark vision uh, again just to be able to see things i did think about whether or not i would give like a, a sense maybe just blind sight or tremor sense but again i thought no, that's just going to get a little bit murky and and because obviously in the last of us the zombies they don't necessarily have some of the harder ones don't have uh sight to yeah. fight against but again that was just something i might do for a later one and then languages finally finally you know the the last thing on the list and essentially instead of just coming up with my own language i just took the the language of the air elementals and the water elementals and just put them in there because it it kind of makes sense aquan and auron yeah Mm -hmm. exactly and there you go the perfect challenge rating for creature for use in whatever campaign you want to throw horrifying zombie ice monsters at people (laughs) that can grab onto people oh the idea of it it latches onto you and then does cold damage just by being next year yeah oh (laughs) horrific You'd want to kill those things quickly. Yeah, and I will say, feel free to use it in your campaigns, but they are called Frostbiters. Ignore Ryan. That's a great name for a creature. (laughs) It's wonderful. I love a good pun. It's absolutely wonderful. I will give you that. You want to hear about my one? I do want to hear about your one, because I I set you the (laughs) challenge of doing a high-level monster, and good lord, Ryan, it's it's terrifying. (laughs) Exactly. So I wanted to go for something that was going to be, you know, a big bad for a campaign so something that's really 
end of the road, you want to throw this against people of a high level. So we're starting from the top. Tell you what, do you want to go through the steps and I'll talk through it? Is that the easiest way of doing it? That sounds perfect because then I don't have to talk as much. Hooray. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Step one, what is the, the name of this monstrosity, this creature you've created for us? So I kind of had an idea of a skeleton, well-dressed, massive, with a huge mace, an ability to be clever enough to rule large undead kingdoms and to be regal in some way. So I called her the Mistress of Bones. Yes, yes. <laughs> kind of like imagine like obsidian in her eyes and like yeah. a large like purple and black cape and just black bones. Tick, tick, tick. When, when can we see this in our campaign, Ryan? I'm, I'm <laughs> based on name alone. We shall see. So we've got, got the name, got the concept, which is really good. What size did you go for in step two? I wanted about 20 feet tall, so I went for huge. Huge. Excellent. What type of creature did you go for in step three? Undead. I thought that one was pretty easy. Uh, Obvious. You've always got options. It could have been a fiend, possibly. Mm. It could have been a monstrosity. But I like the undead flavor to it. Uh, step four, alignment. What did you go for? Well, the Mistress of Bones wants to take over the world, so lawful evil is always a good one for that. Mm, nice, nice, nice. So then we'll do your method, the slight twist on this. So we expected challenge rating, so step six, what did you go for? What did you want to get from this? I want it to be a deadly encounter for a party up to like sort of level 16 or 17, so I want that to be a big bad, so I want the challenge rating 20. And, uh, and you wrote down there the proficiency bonus of plus six, which is good to know. That is, yeah, plus six proficiency. Excellent. So then we skip back to step five, uh, ability scores and modifiers. What were you going for? So I find this really, really difficult. So yeah. what I did was I picked a challenge rating creature of a similar body type, similar sort of style of play that was about the same challenge rating. So I went for a Baylor, which is a challenge mm -hmm. rating 19 demon. Uh, it's proper, you shall not pass you know, the, the the Balrog creature from Lord of the Rings. It's a huge, like, ice and fire, winged, horrible creature. <laughs> and I just borrowed its stats. So it goes simply as strength 26, dex 15, con 22, intelligence 20, wisdom 16, charisma 22. And I took that and thought, well, it's not quite what I want. This is mm. a, a an undead huge creature. So I tweaked it a little bit. I changed the decks from 15 to 10 because mm -hmm. I thought, well, I wanted her to be a little less nimble. <laughs> and I pushed the con up from 22 to 26 because I wanted mm -hmm. to give that impression of being absolutely tough and and literally just an undead. You know that zombie sort of strength? Yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to give her a little bit less... I just wanted to smooth over the intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. So I changed charisma from 22 to 20, and I changed wisdom from 16 to 20. So it's just 20 mm. across the board. So 26 mm. strength, 10 dex, 26 con, 20 intelligence, 20 wisdom, 20 charisma. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Step seven, armor class. What did you go for? So I wasn't entirely sure. So I used the table. I went straight for 19. And that's the thing we always keep saying, if in doubt, use the table. It is actually exactly. it's very, very helpful. Cool. Uh, step eight, hit points. What were you thinking in that? So I went again for the table because I wasn't entirely sure. I tried to use hit dice. I tried to work that out. It mm. wasn't working for me. So I went straight in the middle of the band and gave her 375 hit points. Yeah, that's the thing. I think when I first looked at this, I was like, uh, just average. I don't, don't make it tricky for me. So yeah, I think that's a good, a nice to go for the <laughs> nice average, but very high hit points. Oh, no, thank you. Step nine, damage, vulnerabilities, resistances, and immunities. What did you go for? What I did is I kind of had two reference points here. I knew she was undead. I've got the Baylor for physical stats, but the Baylor is a demon. So mm -hmm. what I did is I took a Death Knight. A Death Knight is a challenge rating 17 and is also undead. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty tough. And they are immune to necrotic and poison damage, mm -hmm. which is pretty common for pretty much all undead. I also then looked at the table. So for a challenge rating 17 or more creature to have immunities against a damage type that was relevant to most encounters yes. it tells you to times it by 1.25 mm -hmm. but i didn't because i assume at level 20 <laughs> necrotic and poison damage wouldn't be so much of a limitation that level mm. 17 to 20 players would have a problem with it so mm -hmm. i left effective hit points 
as alone. is. Mm -hmm. And then nothing for uh, resistances or uh, vulnerabilities, I see. Nope, vulnerabilities. It says that you don't need one. So I no. decided for a big bad, I didn't want anything surprising me as a DM. So I left the re vulnerabilities off by just keeping a simple and resistances you could throw in all kinds of stuff maybe resistance to non-magical damage or yeah. this or that but i didn't want to rule anything out particularly i want just all damage types to be fair and mm. to be honest there was nothing i was going to throw in that was going to make too much of an impact so i kept it as is oh very good very good and yeah as we said that's totally cool because i think a lot like i said it was like when i was doing this it was like oh well yeah resistant to all damage from non-magical weapons do that you know exactly like a Baylor has resistance to pretty much every magical type but a death knight doesn't so i was mm. like well as an undead maybe she is susceptible to all damage she's just soaks it up with large hit points rather than being specifically resistant to stuff exactly all right uh step 10 attack bonuses what did you do for attack bonuses so I know that I'm going to give her some spells. So I had to work out two here. Um, I wanted to work out her attack bonus with a melee weapon. So I, instead of using the suggested, I calculated it based on her actual stats because I thought that would be more relevant. Mm -hmm. So you've got plus eight on strength and you've got plus six proficiency, which gave her plus 14 with a melee attack. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know whether to use intelligence, wisdom or charisma, but luckily they're all plus five. All so a spell attack for her is plus 11. And that averages out to plus 13. Step 11, damage. Tell me, what, what does the Mistress of Bone do for damage, Ryan? <laughs> so I kept reading that you could do this any way you wanted and just it would come good at the end. So I decided to, to test that out. <laughs> this is a big campaign ending boss, okay? I wanted to give her something with a bit of shock and awe to open a combat to make people go, huh, this is a problem. So I gave her <laughs> Meteor Swarm, which is a level nine spell that Good does 40 D6 damage. Oh yeah, my God. Exactly. <laughs> so I assumed using the sort of the way that it tells you to not only work out how much damage something does, but if it's a, a cone ability or a spell that hits multiple people, you have to assume that it hits multiple people. Mm -hmm. So I took the average damage for Meteor Swarm, which is 140. That's 40 <sighs> D8, yeah, D6. <laughs> Uh, and I assumed it hit three targets, so that's 420 damage. And I assumed she only can use it once in a combat, so it's an opening salvo, and then that's that. She has a great sword that I worked out based on using the book. So mm -hmm. it says for huge monsters, which she is, I believe it tells you to triple the weapon Yes, dice. that's it. So yep. a great sword is normally 2d6, so that's 66 plus 8, which is average of 29. And she can swing that thing three times in a turn. So that's 87 damage total. <laughs> And for her ranged, I thought, what better than Finger of Death? Lovely necromancy spell. No. That averages out at 63 damage, which is 78 plus 30. Oof, brutal. <laughs> I'm disliking her more and more. I see her as a cool thing, but I realize now that I do not want to, I don't want to even meet her in a dark alley, to be honest with you. <laughs> so that's the overall damage you've then got to do, which is the, mm. the weird thing. Because it's you've got to think, Meteor Swarm clearly does the most damage there, but you only use it once in a combat. Yeah. And then I was assuming in, in an average of three rounds, she would use Finger of Death and then Melee probably in the other two rounds. Mm -hmm. So what I did is you take 420 damage for Meteor Swarm, 63 from Finger of Death, and the 87 from Melee. You add them all together and divide by three to find the average, and the overall damage per round for her is 190. Bloody hell. Even I can't take that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Step 12, save DCs. What did you do for this then? So the save DC, I think I just calculated it from the table. Um, which worked out to be exactly the same as the spell. So it's 8 plus 5 plus 6 gives 19, and the table said 19. So I thought, yay, that works. Amazing, amazing. Then special traits, actions, and reactions. What does what does the Mistress of Bone have? What's she, what's she got up her sleeve? So the innate spell casting pretty much has been worked in already. So I gave her that, and that's the Finger of Death and the Meteor Swamp. So you don't need to do anything on that. That's already kind of taken into account. I gave her Thrightful Presence because if um, it says if the people are more than 10th level, you don't have to worry about it. So I thought, yep, great. I can chuck that in and not change the challenge rating. That's wonderful. I gave her Legendary Resistance. So it tells you if you do that, if they are level 11 or higher, which she is, Mm -hmm. then for every legendary resistance, you up her effective each, uh, HP by 30. So I gave her three of them. So she's got effectively 90 more health. 
And I gave her three legendary actions, assuming that one of them would be spent in some sort of movement or teleporting, and then two of them would be to make melee attacks. I added 58 damage per round onto the 190 that she had before. Good grief. Oh, no, thank you. Speed, then. Is she a fast lady? (laughs) She is. I gave her a flight of 60 feet. Um, because she can move about she's a she's a boss at the end of the game you know you've got to give her something and you don't have to change the ac because of that because we are more than 10th level step 15 saving throw bonuses what did you do for this so i wanted to make her quite tough and with a challenge rating 20 monster the additional proficiency you get to saves is plus six so I thought, oh, that makes some saves really tough. Mm-hmm. I thought undead, what do other people have? I decided to plump for constitution, wisdom, intelligence, and charisma, all to get the plus six, mm. um, assuming that she wasn't very dexterous. And the strength, well, she's pretty strong as it is. She doesn't need an additional bonus. Yeah. The con was just purely because maybe she's got some spells, but maybe she's undead. So, you know, she's just pretty mm. tough. And that adds effectively a plus two to the defensive challenge rating when you work it all out. So the big reveal, I guess, in step 16, what is the final challenge rating? What did you work out? Well, you can see it it sort of, um, it was intriguing (laughs) because it didn't come out as kind of I expected. So I I went for the the health as it was, but when I added the 90 from the legendary resistances, Mm -hmm. it came to 465, which plonks us right in the middle of challenge rating 22. Then the AC change, there was no change. 22 has 19 AC. She's got a 19 AC. No change. So then I plus two for the saving throws, and we get to a defensive challenge rating of 24. And what about offensive? So offensively, we worked out that she had damage of about 248 once you added in all the legendary actions, the spells averaged out and everything like that. So 248 damage per turn puts you right into, or just on the top end of challenge rating 26. (sighs) So challenge rating 26, that gives you an attack bonus of plus 12. So my attack bonus was plus 14 to plus 11. You could average that out to be plus 13. I kind of assumed that most of the damage would be split kind of between the first spell and then everything. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't change it from 26, effectively. You can see my my document says a slightly wrong answer because when you actually (sighs) average it out, you've got a defensive rating of 24, an offensive rating of 26. It averages to a challenge rating 25 25. creature. So what I ended up doing was I ended up going way over Mm. what I originally intended because it just went went over. That's incredible. And then sort of to finally sort of finish off Mistress of Bones, what kind of skills or conditions, immunities and languages did you you go for? Well, skills-wise, I could give her proficiency in anything and it wouldn't change the challenge rating. So I just plonked for perception, investigation, arcana, history. I gave her double and survival just because I could. Um, <laughs> so she's got plus 12 in that now. So that's, oh my that's God. pretty good. Doesn't really make a difference. No. The condition immunities, I just went for exhaustion, frightened, and poisoned because there's a pretty standard undead mm-hmm. ones. Passive perception works out to be 21. And just because she's an end game boss, I gave her 120 feet of true sight because it doesn't make a difference. (laughs) Can't even creep up on this lady. (laughs) Exactly. And languages, I went for the catch all and gave her telepathy because then she can talk any language and it's not not a problem. Wow. I mean, yeah, that's a world ending boss there, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> and, and to be fair, I learned a lot there in the sense that some of the skills, and uh, they change the ending challenge rating more than you expect. So mm-hmm. if I wanted to bring it down a little bit, for instance, I could bring the offensive challenge rating down pretty easily by swapping out a Meteor Swarm, for instance, and replacing mm-hmm. it with Fireball. Mm-hmm. That would make a, a big difference to the average damage. I could perhaps limit her legendary actions a little bit to give her a little bit less damage on legendary actions. Mm-hmm. I could take away some health because I've given her effectively plus 90 health with the legendary action. So I can mm. take 90 health away from her 375 and give her 285, and that would bring down her challenge rating as well. So there are ways you could limit this to bring it back mm-hmm. down and squeeze her into a challenge rating 20 if you wanted to. I guess for me, like looking through all this stuff and thinking like, you know, does would you encourage me to do, create more monsters or create more customizable stuff in it? A hundred percent, yes. Because even though, like we kind of have demonstrated with both of our monsters, you can create anything that you want. It just takes a little bit of tweaking. And essentially, 
if you just throw it into an encounter and it doesn't go well, or you, you play test it and it doesn't work, you, the players don't know that you created that monster. You could just be like, oh, the Wizards of the Coast, it, oh, what, a, what a rubbish monster. And, <laughs> and you can always tweak it. And, that, and that's the thing, my sort of takeaway message from this all is that, you know what, the tool is there. Have a go at it and then add it to your campaigns or swap uh, encounters for something different and see if people notice. And the two takeaway tables are, so the one on page 274 is really, really good. That's the one that just gives you all the stats you need for a quick monster. And I really think the pages on 280 and 281 are really good. If you just need an idea of what to throw at people, you can just tweak people so much, just little, little silly things. It's, um, oh, it's really good. I quite yeah. like it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you enjoy this? Was it cathartic for you or did you get yourself a bit scared? Oh, I was very scared, Ryan. I, I It was a lot of steps. Um, but like you said, it's it's a mixture of my, my, my sort of my sort of takeaway thing from it is that there's a lot of words in D&D and having sometimes if your brain's not in the right place, it, it takes a little while to go in. But actually having a step by step guide and actually what we've done, like going through our both of our creations and talking about something low level, something that has spells and stuff is actually so useful. And so I hope this guide whether or not you want to use our creatures or if you think they're naff and you can create your own better ones that's it like i i've actually really enjoyed this process and i think I, as she says you know t- touch wood touch the table that if i was going to run more regular campaigns if we if we ever got around to doing our, our fabled sort of like everyone is an adventurer guild and everyone does different mm. dms maybe i would challenge myself to make all the creatures in that not only is the adventure something i've created but actually all the creatures are stuff that i've come up with or flavored uh, to be unique to that bit so yeah, yeah. exactly I, I would challenge everybody listening to this if you want to give it a go open a monster manual pick a random monster and challenge yourself to change that monster without changing any of the stats into something totally different purely by changing how you describe it if you can get your head around that then suddenly the game opens up um, and then chuck in a couple of things from page 280 of the dungeon master's guide and you'll be you'll be laughing really quickly your players might be crying though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good fun. I enjoyed that. That was really, really good. Oh, and thank you. Now I just want to put the Mistress of Bones in a campaign and give her loads of frostbiters just as pets. Oh, I no. think that would be but no, really fun. They they'd answer to no one. No. <laughs> so Ryan, what is our next topic? What is the next I'm guessing world building thing we're gonna be doing? Or is it something completely completely out there? Well, Fiona, you oh. always get at me for saying that I do world building things rather than doing sort no of way. actual module stuff. <laughs> so whilst, and this is because I'm a little disorganized, I haven't picked the exact one yet. Mm. I will be doing some of the pre-made material from the Eberron book because Ooh. there are some really cool things in there. So stay tuned. I'll pick something and it'll be really good. Nice. Yes, Eberron. I'm looking forward to it. That's going to be good. <laughs> So Ryan, because I've I've remembered, I remembered. Is there anything you'd like to plug? No, apart from a bath or a bucket mm. or something with a hole in it, I'm fine. It's so warm. <laughs> it's so warm. <laughs> it's boiling. Now you can find me on YouTube. I am Ursa Ryan. I play games and more importantly have a Discord where I would love to talk about things like uh Civ 6 but also Dungeons and Dragons come and talk about the podcast Fiona's on it as well you can come and say hi to both of us um but you've got more D&D stuff out at the moment which is much more relevant yes D&D stuff or just RPG stuff Ryan RPG stuff it's, it's all the same it's, it's all the same, same. I'm sorry I had a panic then thinking something else come out that I'm not aware of um that project you said you'd edit for me <laughs> <laughs> so my name's Fiona I run the what am I rolling uh, podcast which is an uh, twice monthly RPG podcast uh going great going well uh appearing still going good still going good Appearing here, there, and everywhere. The talk from UK Games Expo is probably up. It's probably got loads of views. It's probably I'm probably great on it. Um, so I heard you were famous. I'm famous. <laughs> sad, sad times. Um, there's that. Um, a Kickstarter's just ended. Uh, whether or not it got funded or not is something else. But I was a part of it. I should be writing a adventure for uh, Tales of Pride, which is a Kickstarter sort of anthology for pretty fairy princesses, which I. Haven't run for what am I rolling? But I've played. That is a lot of strange concepts there. It, wow. It, yeah, good there's luck. a lot. There's well, a lot of things. Um, it's it's that's all good. Brilliant. Well, until we can hit feast upon that with our ears, we will see you all next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>